Hello everybody. I hope you're having a good day. My name is Brett Wilson. I'm one of the adult Bible class teachers here at Tombaugh Bible Church. This is the adult Bible class lesson for April the 1st. You can see a picture of me. And here's probably a bit better or more recognizable picture of me. And it's one that won't break your television set because Linda is in it. We're starting today a series, a 10-lesson series on parables on the road to the cross or parables from the Gospel of Luke. And our teachers are Tim Matthews, Tim Burdett, Kyle Toomey, and Ted Emerson, and, and me. And this series will go through June, early June, Lord willing. And so today, in this lesson, you're going to have something less than 40 minutes of a lesson, and I've sprinkled it liberally with a number of uh, cartoon illustrations. So if you have kids around, they might enjoy that as well. Let's just take a few minutes to pray for the class and pray for us as a body right now. Father, we certainly do come to you in all of this chaos and all of this uh, crisis, medically and economically, and we ask your help. Father, we pray that you would protect us. We pray that in everything that happens, though, that we might glorify you no matter what, and that we would have opportunities to share the gospel, and that we would take those opportunities to share the gospel. Please open our ears and our hearts as we listen to this study today, that we might glorify Jesus Christ. We ask this in his name, through the power of the Spirit. Amen. The parables on the road to the cross. And here's our intro. What was the first name of the Star Wars character who was friends with Chewbacca, Han Solo, and Princess Leia? It was, softball now, Luke, Luke Skywalker. Not the Luke of the Gospel. Who is the only Gentile to author a Bible book? It's not Nebuchadnezzar. He only authored a bit of a chapter. It is Luke. Who wrote most of the New Testament? Well, another softball out there, but it's not Paul. It is Luke again. And what books did Luke write? So here's one easy pitch right over the plate. Luke and the book of Acts. And scholars consider Luke and Acts to be a single two-part composition. And both Luke and Acts were written for a sponsor, a patron, who may have financially supported Luke as he did his research and as he wrote these books. What was the name of that sponsor? So let's read Luke from chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. So the name of the sponsor is Theophilus, and there's a picture of Theophilus. He is likely a Gentile. He's possibly an aristocrat. He is called most excellent by Luke. And he may have been a Roman official of some standing. He was possibly also a God-fearer, and that is a Gentile who worships at the synagogue, worships God, the living God of Israel, but has not completely converted to Judaism, and that would be before his conversion to Christianity. What does his name mean? It means lover or friend of God. Theos, the, word, the Greek word for God, and philos, is the word that means the love of friendship or the love of brotherly affection. Was it a real name? Well, maybe. We don't really know. It could have been a name by which he was known within the Christian community. It could have been his real name. It could be that Luke is using this name in order to protect Theophilus' identity as a Roman official. Does Luke directly state that he is the author of either Luke or Acts? And surprisingly enough, the answer is no. So how do we know that he was the author? Well, we have to do a little bit of detective work here. And so, first of all, externally, external to the scriptures, by 200 AD, the early church was unanimous that Luke authored both Luke and Acts. And the very first canon 
The Muratorian canon attributes the authorship of Acts, and maybe Luke as well, to Luke. And so what's a canon? Well, it is not a free in word that describes something that shoots a cannonball, but it is a two in word, and it describes a collection of books that the church considered to be or recognized was apostolic, recognized was inspired by God through the Holy Spirit. How do we know Luke was the author? Well, the presence of the word we in Acts indicates the author was a companion of Paul's. And so Luke joined Paul in Troas, it's a port city in western Turkey. That's the first time we kind of run into Luke on Paul's second journey. And he was also with Paul on part of his third journey. So in Acts 16, verses 8 through 10, it says, They went down to Troas, and they in this case would have been Paul. Timothy and Silas, and maybe some others. You can see pictures of them there. And then in, in verse 9, it says, And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. So Paul's in Troas with his friends. And a man of Macedonia was standing there in this vision, urging Paul and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And verse 10 then says, And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we, and this is where we believe that Luke was brought in to the traveling group of Paul's, we sought to go on to Macedonia. So they got a boat and went to Greece, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. And so Luke has now joined Paul, Timothy, and Silas. How do we know that Luke was the author again? We need, to look th we need to consider that Luke was with Paul on his trip to Rome and in Paul's first imprisonment. This is kind of a key fact. Acts 28 verse 16 says that when we came to Rome, you may remember that Paul was imprisoned in Jerusalem, taken to Caesarea Maritima on the coast of Israel. Uh, Herod's palace was put into prison for two years and then was released to go to uh, Rome uh, with, under Roman guard. And so now he is in Rome, and Luke is with him on that journey. A key piece of evidence is that in two, Paul, two of Paul's letters written during this first imprisonment, Luke is with him. And so this is really uh, kind of the key that secures all this idea of Luke being the author of Acts. And those verses are Colossians 4.14 and Philemon verse 24. So of all of Paul's companions, Timothy, Titus, Silas, everybody else, who could have possibly written Acts, Luke is deemed by scholars to be the best fit. And so the author of Luke, as well as Acts, are the same person. So we've confirmed that Luke wrote Acts. Now we're going to find out that it's almost undoubtedly Luke wrote uh, the Gospel of Luke as well. So let's look at the scripture We've read these verses from Luke chapter 1, and this author, whoever it is, let's say we don't know, is writing an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. Well, in Acts chapter 1, Luke writes, In the first book, O Theophilus, I've dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. So we know Luke wrote Acts, and because the author of Luke is, is also writing to most excellent Theophilus, and because in Acts 1, verse 1, it says, in the first book, which would have been the Gospel of Luke, we can therefore say with high confidence that Luke also, in addition to writing Acts, wrote the Gospel of Luke. So who was Luke? Well, we've just mentioned that he was a companion of Paul. He was also there during Paul's second imprisonment and until the end of Paul's life. So after the first imprisonment, Paul got out. Uh, of prison, and apparently traveled for a few years, was arrested again, brought to Rome, put in the Mamertine dungeon, and then beheaded by Nero. So 2 Timothy 4, 11, first part of it says, Luke alone is with me. So Luke, very faithful to Paul. And we do not know, but you can imagine that probably when Paul was beheaded, maybe Luke was allowed to get the body and take it to the Christian community and bury it. But that's something that's just fully conjecture. We don't know. But Luke clearly loved Paul. Well, Luke was a Gentile, but may have been a God-fearer. We've talked about that. 
He may have been Syrian from Antioch and not necessarily a Greek, although he certainly spoke excellent Greek because the Gospels and Acts are written in some of the best Greek in the New Testament. He has a very good understanding of the Old Testament and Hebrew literary forms, and it's, it's very hard to imagine that he did not speak and was not fluent in Hebrew. And we can see this in Mary's song in Luke chapter 1, the Magnificat, and in Zechariah's prayer, the Benedictus, because they show this real deep familiarity with the Old Testament and are in the form of Old Testament prophecies. Again, Luke uses the term fearers of God, so that indicates that he was probably a fearer of God. He's at least familiar with the term. We also know from Paul's writings in Colossians that he was a doctor. And there you see Luke, he's got his medical white tunic on and his first century stethoscope, uh, Luke the doctor. So he uses medical terms as well. One of these uh, in Luke 14 too, he says, and behold, there was a man before him who had dropsy. Well, that's a technical term in Greek. Dropsy is still a medical condition. It is where fluid just gathers and collects in your legs and you're not able to get that fluid out. And it's possible that as a doctor, Luke was a freed slave and that was common in the first century for doctors and accountants and managers to be slaves. In this case, Luke would have been freed to travel with Paul. And this may account for Luke's, Luke's concern for those who were on the outside in Jewish society, one, those who were not accepted by the Jewish leadership and the Pharisees. Now, Luke is also a nickname for Lucius, and in the Roman world, uh, if you were a slave, let's say your, your owner's name was Lucius, you were likely to get a nickname, Luke. And so that's another indication that Luke may have been a slave at one time. And now we know also, because Luke tells us in the first chapter of Luke, that he was not an eyewitness, but he went around to all the eyewitnesses that he could find as a diligent and very careful historical researcher. When did he compose his gospel? The last event in Acts can be tied to about 62 AD. And we know that when he writes to Theophilus as he has finished composing Acts, which might be a couple of years after 62, it might be 63, 64 AD, he talks about a first book, that first book being the Gospel of Luke. It's likely that Luke finished the book of Luke sometime in the early 60s, maybe before 62 AD. What is the purpose of the Gospel of Luke as stated by the author? And he says in verse 4, chapter 1, that you, Theophilus, may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. And so... The purpose is to assure Theophilus and, all, and us today, all believers, of the historical reliability, the historical foundation for the gospel truths of Jesus Christ, the historical foundation for our faith. So there are two key themes in Luke. One is the universality of the gospel. Now that doesn't mean that the gospel goes out to all the stars and planets, although it someday probably will. It means that the gospel is good for all types of people, both Jew and Gentile, the poor, the rich, men and women, kids, everybody. And so we see this in several ways. Luke begins his genealogy. Actually, he's writing backward, but the first person in his genealogy is Adam, who is the start of all the human race. And so the Gentiles and the Jews are included in Adam. That compares to Matthew, who speaks of genie, Jesus' genealogy starting. He starts it with Abraham, who would have been the, the first Hebrew, the first person from whom the Jews came. Luke really has a special fondness for social outcasts. Uh, lepers, for example. The sinful woman who comes to him at the dinner with the Pharisee and pours perfume on him and wipes Jesus' feet with her hair. The criminal on the cross and Zacchaeus, and you may remember the Bible story, Zacchaeus was a tax collector despised in Jewish society. 
he was so small, he couldn't see Jesus when Jesus came into Jericho, so he climbed up a sycamore tree, and there is Zacchaeus for you. And he has a special concern for women. Lots of stories, more than any other gospel, about women. The birth account of Jesus, Mary, Elizabeth, Anna, the widow's son in chapter 7, all the women who supported Jesus, Martha and Mary, special dear friends of Jesus, the story about the poor widow and giving the two coins to the coins to the treasury in the temple, and then the stories of women at Jesus' crucifixion, burial, and then later at his resurrection. So there's two key themes in the book of Luke. One and the other one has to do with the Holy Spirit, the second theme. And we see this at Jesus' birth. In Luke 1.35, this talks about the conception of Jesus in Mary. And it says, The Holy Spirit will come on you, Mary, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born, that is Jesus, will be called the Son of God. So right at the beginning of Jesus' life, the Holy Spirit, or His incarnation. We also know that Elizabeth was filled with the Spirit, the mother of John the Baptist. Zachariah, the father of John the Baptist, filled with the Spirit. And in Luke chapter 2, the Spirit comes on an old man named Simeon in the temple who comes to see and holds the baby Jesus. Really remarkable story. We see it in Jesus' life that the Holy Spirit is there. The Spirit descends upon Jesus at his baptism. And interestingly, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, he leads Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted. So it's remarkable that Jesus Christ, the incarnate Son of God, fully God and fully man, as man, depends and leans on the Holy Spirit and follows the Holy Spirit. Just to add the Holy Spirit, whom Jesus will later give to his disciples and to us. And then at the report of the return of the 72 disciples and their, and their work, uh, travels, and their mission around Israel, Jesus is full of joy through the Holy Spirit. And at the end, as we said before, Jesus promises the gift of the Holy Spirit to his apostles and to all believers. I am sending, he says, the promise of my Father, who is the Holy Spirit, upon you. So all of our parables in this series come from what is called Luke's travel narrative. That's Jesus' long journey to Jerusalem. What is this travel narrative in the Gospel of Luke? Well, it's the largest single section in Luke, about 40% by words of the Gospel. It is unique to Luke. Very little of it occurs in any of the other Gospels. It emphasizes Jesus' goal, his intent, his purpose to go to Jerusalem to the cross. And it begins in Luke 9, 51, chapter 9, verse 51. And when the days drew near for him, that's Jesus, to be taken up, that is to be raised on the cross, to be buried to be resurrected, to rise again, and to ascend into heaven, he, that's Jesus, set his face to go to Jerusalem. And I can remember the King James uh, translation of this verse. It says, he set his face, probably a very literal translation, he set his face like a flint to go to Jerusalem. He would not be deter deterred. So this account, this travel narrative, ends about, Ten chapters later, in Luke 19, 44, and verse 41, the beginning verse of this paragraph, says, And then when Jesus drew near and saw the city, that is, saw Jerusalem, he wept over it. And so Jesus goes on this long journey to the cross. It's not a direct line route. It's more of a journey of destiny. And many of Jesus' parables, the ones that we love the most, are recorded only in this travel narrative. Let's talk about parables and how to interpret them. What are they? Well, they're fictional short stories that teach a spiritual lesson. And the word parable comes from the Greek word parabolo, which means parallel. We get the word parallel, which means alongside 
two lines that are alongside. So alongside, and then balo is what it sounds like. It's a ball. So alongside to throw or to put one thing by the, along the side of another. And so parables are recognizable life stories. They're not necessarily entirely realistic, but they're something everybody who was listening to him would recognize. They're set in the context of first century Jewish culture, but they carry an alongside spiritual meaning. They are basically metaphors through which Jesus teaches about God and about man and about sin and about salvation. He teaches theology through metaphor. And so Jesus' parables range from very simple similes. A simile is where something is like something else, such as the kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed, to more complex and lengthy stories like the Good Samaritan. And so parables, the intent is to draw the listener in, to get you so absorbed in the story, you're really kind of sucked into the story and you're really deeply into it in order to draw out from you, after you've heard it, and as you're hearing it, and as you're thinking about it, to draw a response out of you, to draw the listener in, and to draw out a response from the listener. And they do this through identification. Well, what do I mean by that? Jesus' aim was to get his listeners to really think about how the characters in his parables might represent him. Who, who am I in this story that Jesus is telling. And as a result, Jesus very often, or very rarely, does he give the moral of the story. He almost always leaves his parables open-ended. And so he leaves the aha moment to the listener. Really interesting. How not to interpret the parables now. Let's, we'll do this. We'll do the how not to do it before we do how to interpret them. So. One way not to do it is as detailed allegories. So until the 20th century, allegorization was the favorite way of most Christian scholars and preachers to interpret the parables. So all the way from the church fathers around 300 AD, all the way to the you know, 1900, this was the, the way people interpreted the parables. It was remarkable, 1600 years. And so in allegorical interpretation, all the minor details in a parable stand for something other than themselves. And the spiritual storyline as a result is really disconnected from the actual parable because the spiritual storyline is this allegory. And so, for example, in the parable of the prodigal son, the father gives a ring to the prodigal son when he returns. And some have said in these allegories that the son represents baptism. I mean, the ring represents baptism, uh, excuse me. That's crazy. I mean, how can that be? And then the robe represents immortality. The father puts his robe around the son. And some say that represents immortality. And the big party, the banquet that the father puts on for his son, who is lost and now found, represents the Lord's Supper. And the fatted calf represents Jesus, because the fatted calf dies, it was killed, and all the party partygoers fed off the fatted calf. Well, I think that's all this stuff is a bit of a stretch, and there's there's real problems with this approach. And one of the problems is you could come in as an interpreter and arbitrarily force just about any idea onto the parable, and nobody could say that's wrong. The parables were divorced from any objective meaning. They were divorced from the text, actually. The other way not to interpret the parables is as having only a single point. So in the 20th century, scholars began to say, man, all this allegorization is crazy. I mean, why, why would you do that? That can't be right. So they started to say that there was only one point in a parable, sort of a complete reaction to the other side. Well, there are issues with that as well. And for example, if the parable of the prodigal son has only one point, which one do we choose? The fatherhood of God? The parable clearly teaches that. The nature of sin and depravity? Absolutely, in the prodigal son. Self-righteousness? Sure. And true repentance? Yes, we see all of these things. But we see other things as well. So which one do we choose? 
So now we'll talk about how to interpret the parables. And the first thing you need to do is to capture the context. This is true of any scripture that you're coming to. Capture, understand the context in which the paragraph, or in this case, the parable is set. So what's the scene in which Jesus tells the parable? Who's in, and by the scene, I mean, what's happened just before? What's going on now? What's happened a chapter ago? What's, what's happening when Jesus tells this parable? Who is in his audience? Disciples? Sinners? Pharisees? Other Jewish onlookers? People at a dinner? All sorts of things to think about, about who Jesus' audience is, because the parable's characters usually correlate to the groups of people in Jesus' audience. Another thing to consider in terms of context is how does the first century Jewish culture and life in Palestine inform our understanding. And so, for example, in the par parable of the Good Samaritan, obviously the person who rescues the injured man, the man who'd been beaten up by a criminal and left on the side of the road to Jericho, he's a Samaritan. And Samaria was an area between Galilee and Judea. And since the time that the northern kingdom was taken away by Assyria, that the Assyrians came immediately after that and repopulated that area with um, Gentile peoples who were pagans. And so the religion of the Samaritans was a mess. It was sort of a mixture of worship of Yahweh and worship of other gods. And they were all messed up about that. And you see some of that in John 4 with the woman at the well. And so it's very surprising then, a shock almost, that a Samaritan could be good, could be the hero of one of Jesus' parables. So after you captured the context, note the scenes in the story. This is just common sense. If there's more than one scene in the parable, who's in it, what's happening, and what happens before and after. Note the number of players in the drama. So about 70% of Jesus' parables have three main characters or groups of people, and very often it's a master or a master type, and two contrasting subordinates. And we certainly see this in the prodigal son. We see the master who's the father, and then the older and younger son. A smaller number of parables contrast two characters. We know the parable of the wise and foolish builders. The wise builder built his house on the rock. The foolish builder built his house on the sand. And when the rains came down, well, you know what happened. And some are very simple one-part metaphors or stories, like the mustard seed. We talked about that before. Fourth, we want to consider the parable from the perspective of each of the main characters. So each will reflect part of the parable's meaning. And finally, the multiple points, and there can be many points or spiritual principles within the parable, can often be combined into a single sentence or overall spiritual lesson. Well, this sounds very complicated, all these five points, but really it's just kind of common sense interpretation. So how to apply the parables? Once you have the meaning of the parable, you've interpreted it, and it's spiritual lesson for Jesus' audience, then take it from that first century Jewish world and transfer it across culture and across time to today. So how do the points of the parable and its summary spiritual lesson apply to me? How do they apply to us? So the second question you might ask is, let the Spirit speak deeply, not to just what you do, not to just your behavior, but your heart, your motivations, your mind, your desire for God. And ask yourself, who am I in this parable? Everybody can do that. Kids all the way up to grandparents. Am I one of the characters? Am I sometimes one character and sometimes another? Or am I two characters at the same time? So how is Jesus speaking to us and to me in this parable? And the parables are also intended to elicit, to draw out a response. How does the Spirit want me to respond to what he's pointing out to me in Jesus' parable? And here's some books, just some references for you, a couple of books that you can pick up later if you want to go back and stop the video at this point. We're going to look at the parable of the sower. It is not from Luke, but it is, I'd say, the key parable in Scripture. It is in Luke. 
but we're going to look at the version in Mark. It's also in Matthew. And so we're going to read Jesus' interpretation of the parable. It actually begins in verse 1 of chapter 4 of Mark. We're just going to read Jesus' interpretation. So Jesus says in verse 10, And when he was alone, so in verses 1 through 9, Jesus had been with a larger crowd of Jews. He's speaking from a boat to people gathered on the beach and the disciples there, but there's also other people there as well. Probably in Capernaum, but we don't really know. So when he was alone, those around him with the twelve, so now he's got the twelve disciples plus some others that are followers, they asked him about the parables, and he said to them, To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside, everything is in parables, so that they may indeed see, but not perceive. They may indeed hear, but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. Very tough verse. And he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all or any of the parables? And now he interprets, The sower sows the word. And these, these are the first seeds that the sower sows, are the ones along the path where the word is sown. And when they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And these, the second group of seeds, are the ones sown on rocky ground, the ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. And they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then, when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, they immediately fall away. And others, this is the third type of seed, are the ones sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word and it proves unfruitful. But those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold. The seed sown on the good soil, the fourth type of seed. So let's unpack it. You could call this the parable of the parable of the soils, and that might be better than the parable of the sower. And it is one of the few parables that Jesus explains. We talked about who the audience is. It's a broad collection of Jewish people in Galilee, on the shore, including the disciples. And we've talked about who the audience is in verses 10 through 20. It's the disciples plus some other followers of Jesus. And there are three characters in this parable. It's a three-point or three-part parable. The sower... And here's a sower, he'd have a bag full of seed, and he'd grab up uh, some seed and just scatter it onto the ground. The good soil on which the seed brings fruit, and then the three bad soils is the third type of character. So they're grouped together, the three characters, the sower, the good soil, and the three bad soil. And in all of the bad soil, the seed is unfruitful. And so, just so you can see it, this is a terrace. Israel's very hilly for the most part. And people did terrace farming, and you could have this section of flat land. It's not very very wide in which you could have your ox or your donkey pull a plow, and you could pull a plow through this land and then come back and put seed, sow seed down on it. And you can see where some of the seed would simply fall off the terraces and get into places like weeds or stony pathways or places you just wouldn't want the seed to go. So what does Jesus mean in chapter 4, verse 13 of Mark, when he says, Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all or any of the parables? Well, what he means is, if you don't get this one, you're not going to get any of them. This is the key parable that unlocks all the other parables. So let's look at 4.14. The sower sows the word. What is the seed? Well, it's very clearly the word of God. Okay, It's the parable itself, maybe. Who is the sower? Well, Jesus doesn't say. Almost certainly it is Jesus. You could say that it is God. You could say it's the Holy Spirit. And you could even include us in this sower as we sow the word through the power of the Spirit to others so that others can hear. So why does Jesus speak in parables? Verse 11 and 12 says, To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside, 
everything is in parables so that they may indeed see but not perceive and may indeed hear but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. So Jesus distinguishes between those who accept his word and those who reject it, those who are outside, those who are inside. The disciples have been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but others have rejected it or do reject it. And so his parables, and we're seeing this in the Gospel of John, right? Not necessarily in parable form, but very close to it. His parables divide people. And specifically, parables both conceal or reveal, depending upon whether one is open to hearing what they're really teaching. So the quotation from Isaiah in verse 12, really it means this. If someone rejects the truth of God's word, Jesus' teaching in the parables, for example, then there's no opportunity for repentance and forgiveness. If you walk away from God. If you reject him, if you reject his word, then you will not be able to hear what is in the word, which is God calling you in grace to repent and be forgiven. In 4, 1 through 9, when Jesus is speaking to everybody on the beach, as he's speaking from the boat, he's presenting the parable to a broad Jewish audience. And his physical descendants of Abraham, they would have considered themselves to be God's people So the message here that he's revealing to his disciples about Jews is that what really counts is not your family heritage, but whether you believe, whether you receive my word versus reject it. So in 15 through 20, Jesus explains that the different soils are people. And we're going to look at that real quickly now. There's, we're going to have a table that has the type of soil, what happens in the parable as it's being told, and what happens, what that means spiritually as Jesus has interpreted it, and then what happens to the seed, to the grain, how much grain comes out of the seed. So the first soil is the pathway. And it's very clear, if you show a seed on a pathway, it's easy pickings for a bird. And so you see a bird here picking up some seed. None of it's going to sprout. And so there is no harvest. There's no grain. And Jesus says spiritually that means Satan snatches away the word from the hearers. So if we, the truth, the spiritual truth, if we refuse God's word, God gives us up to become disciples of Satan. Well, that's pretty harsh. But that indeed is what God's word teaches. In Ephesians chapter 2 It says that before we came to Christ, we were followers of the Spirit who is of the power of the air, right? And so we were followers or disciples of Satan. The next type of soil is the rocky soil. So these seeds fall on the rocks, but they don't, there's no soil there, so they don't root, and the seeds germinate, but they burn up. And so there is no harvest. Spiritually, Jesus says, absent God's word being deeply rooted in a person, they will fall away when persecution comes. And so the truth is, if we hear God's word, but we neglect to take it deep into our heart and have it change us, we will not persevere in trial and oppression. The third type of soil is the thorny soil and thorny weeds. The parable says thorny weeds choke out the plant. I have that in my garden, right? I got clover and everything and it's growing over uh, some of the ground cover I have and some of the flowers. And so, you know, it just, they, they can't see any sun. And so the, the good stuff is gonna die because of the weeds. Well, here's a picture of our thorns choking out this little seed that has germinated And because they eventually kill it, there is no harvest. Jesus says this, that worries or fear or the lust for money and possessions push out the place of trust in God and his word. They just push out God and his word from our lives. So a truth is if we seek significance in status, if our wealth and possessions and our status, our things, are the biggest goal in our lives, we're going to wreck our lives. We will, actually, we will walk away from God. 
and our lives will be a mess. And finally, the last soil is the good soil. And in the good soil, the seeds sprout, the plants grow, they flourish. And here you can see the seed in the soil. It, it sprouts, it germinates, it grows up, and it produces many more seeds, bushels and bushels of grain for us to eat. And spiritually, this is talking about a God-toward fruitful life. And so the truth here is delighting in God's word and trusting it and letting it dwell richly within us and obeying it out of love for God, not to earn his favor, but out of love for him, is the heart of a God toward life. So our summary truth is how we respond to God's word is of eternal consequence, for it is how we respond to God himself. We got some applications. First, based on the summary truth and the truth for each soil type in the parable on the previous two pages, how would you evaluate your response to God's word in the last month? And then how is God asking you to change to be a good ground hearer. So these are things to discuss after we close up, which will be in just a minute. And then I put some verses below number C here. So I just would suggest you look at them, soak on them a bit, write down what the Spirit is telling you about you and God's Word. There's some of my favorite verses from the Old Testament. Isaiah 66, the second part of verse 2, this is the one I esteem. He who is humble and contrite in spirit, and who trembles at my word. And Jeremiah 15, 16. When your words came, I ate them. They were my joy and my heart's delight, for I bear your name, O Lord God Almighty. Well, God bless you today. That's our adult Bible class for April 1st. The Lord go with you, and may his face shine upon you. May he turn his face toward you and give you peace. Bye now.